you must do this before choosing a career. All right, so I've kind of talked briefly on this before, but since then I've got new updated information on how to determine whether or not a career path you're considering is right for you. In this video, I'll talk about three things you should be doing before going down a particular career path, as in before you enroll in a certain career path at uni, or do an apprenticeship in this particular trade, or start working your way up in this business, whatever it is, you should be looking at these three things. So real briefly, why do you need a career in the first place? Because it provides extra job stability, and it allows you to get pay increases as the years go on. Things are only going to get more expensive as the years progress. You don't need to understand the whole stock market slash economic models thing like I do. You just need to look at the prices of most essential purchases slash products 40 years ago, the average salaries back then, and then the average cost of goods slash services, and the average salaries these days. You don't need to be an investor to realise the cost of living situation is much worse, and it will continue to get worse. It's quite literally how the financial system is designed. But I won't talk any further about the economic side of things, as this is a career stat focused video, not an investor stat focused one. So it provides job stability, since a career requires some level of education, slash skills, slash training, traits that the general population does not have. I don't know about you, but I don't want to go to bed every night dreading that I might lose my job tomorrow and never be able to find a new one. I personally haven't worried about that since my uni days. You also need a job that provides pay raises to keep up with the cost of living, even though it's hard enough to keep up now as is. For anyone who's new here, I work full-time in accounting and part-time on the weekends at my supermarket job. My accounting job has much more room for pay raises upwards, as I'll go over in this video, but my supermarket job has no such opportunities. You can get raises if you go into management, but these jobs are competitive, since there's quite a number of people at the supermarket who want these roles, and since there's a small barrier to entry for these roles, since almost anyone can get a job working in a supermarket, generally you just need a few years experience coupled with some nepotism and being in the right place at the right time. It's a lot harder to get these types of roles compared to the standard career paths. But in my case, just being a standard team member, I only get raises when the minimum wage gets increased. Which, yes, is nice, but it's not that much extra, and you don't want to have to rely on political changes to get your pay raise. You'd rather have more control over that yourself. For reference... Last financial year, I earned a base increase of $11,175 per year at my accounting job, and an extra $1,500-ish base per year at my supermarket job. Now, yes, I work more hours at my accounting job, so of course I'll end up making more per year with a salary slash wage increase, but the point stands. I have more power to increase my income at my career job rather than my minimum wage slash lower skilled job. I've talked extensively about this concept before. So that's why you should care about a career, more money and more stability. Some people suggest starting a business, but I've made more than one hour and 20 minutes worth of content that talks about why this generally isn't the best path. Of course, some people can do it. But if everyone's businesses were successful, then why are people still working jobs they hate? Because, statistically speaking, your business won't afford you the life you want, providing it ever actually makes a profit in the first place. So, yet another reason you should care about a career. I've been banging the table about picking a career over a business for years. If you want to do a business, do it on the side. A useful, in-demand career is more than likely your best bet. And this is coming from a gambling man. I know my odds. Anyway, let's go over the three things you need to do before choosing a career. Thing one, checking government websites for projected job growth. The reason you check this is because the government controls all. They can enact legislations that can make or break your career. 
So, whenever the government has projected job growth in a particular industry, you can bet they'll either 1. Leave the industry alone or 2. Provide a stimulus to help out that industry. Here in Victoria, Australia for example, recently our government has basically made some nursing degrees free. Maybe all nursing degrees. I'm not totally sure how the healthcare degrees work, but you don't get a student debt for nursing in my state now. This is because we have an enormous shortage of nurses, and the government was actually willing to do something about it, if you can believe that. So if you're living in Victoria, nursing is a fantastic career path due to the abundance of available jobs and support from the government. You have no reason to worry about the government ruining your income source. Contrast this to having a small business. During the 2020 lockdowns, Victoria, specifically Melbourne, had the worst lockdown restrictions in the world. I think it might have been the second worst, but I am pretty sure it was the worst. Our Prime Minister at the time even called out the Premier of our state at the time about his constant lockdowns. Thank fuck he's gone now. But why did I bring this up? I'm talking about the career stat here, not the brand slash business stat. Well, it goes to show how the government can make or break your income streams. You don't see it on mainstream media, of course, but I can tell you for a fact that a lot of small businesses got fucked over and had to shut down due to the number of constant lockdowns. If they were in any other parts of the world, they may have survived the initial lockdowns, but not the additional ones we had here in Victoria. Our state government at the time was so hell-bent on magnifying the danger of the sniffles. I shit you not, I had a co-worker tell me that her dad knew someone who knew someone who died of heart complications or some age-related illness, but they had the sniffles at the time. So, the government wanted to record this as a sniffles death, but they actually died from heart disease or whatever it was. So the government was willing to give that family about 30000 bucks to list that as a sniffles-related death to, you know, prop up their propaganda machine more. I had another case of a friend whose sister's friend was a nurse, and she saw examples of the same shit. It's like if I had a cold, and I died by getting struck by lightning, and my autopsy shows the cause of death was a cold. No, I died due to lightning. I just so happened to have a cold at the time. It's the same thing. They died due to heart disease. It just so happens they had the sniffles at the time. You could argue sniffles elevated the heart issues, but it's not as if COVID... Fuck. But it's not as if the sniffles itself gave those patients heart issues. I have to keep censoring the word because at this point, my channel is actually starting to get a bit bigger. And this video is going to be way too important to be censored or shadow banned. So that's why I have to censor myself. Normally, I don't care. So that additional tangent is to show you, if the government wants to destroy your career slash business, they can do so. We've also seen it in the Netherlands. The government is implementing some restrictions that severely damage the farmers' businesses. No matter how good their businesses were, the government can ruin them all at their will. So this is why checking government statistics on the demand for your job is the number one thing you should do when picking a career path. Usually, the number one tip for these type of videos, people would say stuff like, check how much income you can make. Well, the income you can make doesn't matter if the government doesn't care enough about your industry, aka farming in the Netherlands. Another common bit of number one advice is a fluffy, happy advice of, Pick something you enjoy. As the saying goes, do what you love and you'll never work a day in your life. What this is intended to mean is if you do something you like for work, it won't feel like work. So pick something you like. But I look at it from a different light and I've never actually seen anyone else interpret it this way. And I actually made this quick comment in my Brian Johnson video, but hear me out. Do what you love and you'll never work a day in your life. Because you'll be unemployed. Because the real world doesn't give a shit about what you want to do, the real world cares about the stuff that needs to be done. Cynical, isn't it? But it's true. 
I'd have no issues with sleeping in in the morning, having some breakfast, going to the gym afterwards, coming home, then playing video games for the rest of the day slash night. But I can't do that since I'm not an influencer. I actually have to work. Now, yes, I do enjoy my job, but you have to learn to like your career. If you've seen my Life Path video, you'll know that I never really did. And I've taken pay cuts by staying at this role, as opposed to accepting other offers in the past. I'll do the math on the amount of money I've lost in the past few years by staying at this job in a future video, but back to the original point. Checking the government data, or is it data? Now to input the video data. Or is it data? Data. Data. Oh great, now neither of them sounds right. Or is it neither? To see if they anticipate job growth in a certain field is the number one thing you should be doing before picking any career path. Unfortunately, they have the power to make or break your industry. Another example I'll use to drive the point home is I have two friends who work in like consulting related jobs for apprentices, not just the trades, like apprentice chefs at KFC and whatnot. They're like the intermediary between government funding and other businesses or some shit. Now, they only have jobs due to government subsidies and funding. One of my friends got made redundant since the subsector she was working in had their funding cut from the government. So she had to work at the supermarket job for about six months until she got a new role. This new role was also similar to the old one. They also relied on government funding for apprentices. I'll spare the details for the sake of time, but their income relies on government subsidies and grants and funding. They mentioned how they need to show good results slash good reports to the government in order to keep their funding going, since if they don't, the government is like, well, why are we spending money on this? And they'd cut the taps, meaning they'd no longer have a job. And even then, you still run the risk of the government cutting the funding tap anyway. Here in Victoria, Australia, the financial position of our state is in shambles. Not sure if this was news around the globe or not, but we had to withdraw from hosting the Commonwealth Games recently. Why? Because we have no money. I have a friend I went to uni with who currently works for the Australian Bureau of Statistics. I say currently since he's on a contract, so it's not a permanent full-time position like the one I have. Which is another thing you need to consider when picking career paths and jobs. Do you want to work in an unstable field where you constantly have to fight for contracts? Or do you want something nice and stable? And if you do get fired, then you get a big redundancy package or like you get some notice or something like that. Another thing to consider. And anyway, so he parks at some place nearby the city that has free parking and takes a shuttle bus to the office. The cost for the shuttle bus is way cheaper than paying for nearby parking, but in recent times, he's had to park close to the office since the shuttle bus wasn't running. And I'm like, dude, why isn't the shuttle running? And he's like, the local government can't afford it. Obviously, he does have to pay for a shuttle, but some of that cost is subsidized by the government. I am also fairly certain I saw something about the libraries being shut for a period too, since again, the government pays for this. I only remember this because either that same friend mentioned it or I was going to do something at my local library only to find out that they too were shut. So once again, the government can cut off the tap. Even my friends who do consulting for apprentice related roles, even if they're the best at their jobs and even if they provide good results, the government can still cut off their jobs. Do you get the point now? This is why checking government data or data now to input the video data. Or is it data? Data. Data. Oh, great. Now neither of them sounds right. Or is it neither? For particular careers is the most important thing you can do. It trumps any other thing you should be doing. Doesn't matter how much you enjoy a certain job, the government can cut you off. It doesn't matter if you could earn $200,000 a year at a certain job. If the government doesn't care about that industry or provides no support to that role, or once that job gone in the next three years, the government can eliminate that job before you're even qualified to work in it. Now, you're going to have to find the resources available in your region, since I don't know what websites slash data points to look at in other countries, but try out Ibis World. 
click on resources, click on industry statistics and industry trends, go have a play around in there and gather some ideas from there. If you saw this video, you'll know that I only picked accounting due to realizing it had good job growth based on government data. Thanks to an actually useful uni subject I did. Now, I'm not sure if Ibis World was the exact website I found that info from, but it could have been. But I remember it being from a website you had to have a paid subscription to, but this paid subscription was covered by your university fees. So like your university email details allowed you to log into this particular website to check out their data. It might have been the paid membership section of Ibis World, which is where I found the data that showed accounting had good job growth. I don't know, I can't remember. I'm sorry I can't provide more info. This was like 2016. But even then, that website was probably Australia specific, the one I was looking at anyway, which most of my viewers aren't even from here. But I've given you plenty enough for you to go digging for treasure. I've given you the treasure map. Now it's time for you to find the treasure. Give a man a fish, he'll eat for a day. Teach a man to fish, he'll eat for a lifetime. I'm teaching you how to fish. I'm giving you the treasure map. I'm not giving you a fish. I'm not giving you the treasure. So, to wrap up point one, check out what the government is saying about your intended career path. If they don't see job growth in it, don't do it. Thing two, checking current job postings on job websites for the job you picked from the last point. So, once you've found a career that the government isn't likely to sabotage, or maybe even help out in the future, now you can check current job postings. The reason you don't check job postings first is because obviously these specific jobs you're looking at won't exist in four years' time, or whenever it is you become qualified to work those jobs. But you still need to check these in your area, just in case for some reason they aren't available in your region. The government data isn't going to tell you the exact jobs projected in your local city. They won't say stuff like, oh, if you live in Adelaide, Australia, there is going to be exactly 2,153 jobs in 2028 for nurses. No chance they'll be that specific. They'll say stuff like, there is going to be an expected annual increase of 9.5% per year for jobs in the nursing sector. So now, you check your local region for current jobs relating to nursing. If the government believes there is job growth in your field, and there are a lot of jobs available in your region for that field now, chances are you've got a stable career path on your hands. Checking job postings available in your region is also a good way of gauging how much money you can expect. Once you've found a career that the government isn't likely to cuck, and once you've found that these jobs are abundant currently in your region, now you can check stuff like the expected income. This is where you can also check expected salaries for certain occupations. Take these with a grain of iodized table salt though. I've found, in my experience anyway, these can be a little inaccurate. Point 0.3 can give a more accurate reading of income levels in certain fields, but I'll go over that later in this video. So for example, let's look at accounting salaries in my local region. The region is censored to avoid being doxxed, but as you can see, it's not that high, considering it's the average, which includes all the high rollers. Admittedly, they don't have that much information. They have a lot of info for Melbourne, but not on my local city slash suburb. Even so, these Melbourne suburbs seem quite low. This base salary of around $80,000 per year is actually what I am potentially going to get at my next raise. And this is only a few years into my career, which doesn't even include all the other accountants who've been working for 20 plus years. And even then, the salaries for Melbourne suburbs are shown to be lower on average, which I cannot believe at all. No way. Melbourne is a higher cost of living suburb than my nearby city. No chance are the salaries lower there. I had a friend from the supermarket whose friend's husband moved to the nearby city where I live, but he had to commute back to Melbourne for work each day because he couldn't find any roles in the local city that paid anywhere near as much. I mean, you don't need anecdotal evidence for this. It's common sense. Higher cost of living city equals higher salaries. Now, let's have a look at some of the offers I've been given from recruiters. 
Here you can see I'm being offered 85k base, 90k base, 100k base, and 105k base, all higher than this average figure, despite, once again, me only being a few years into my career. These boots on the ground anecdotal experience don't show up in websites such as salary trackers, hence why I didn't give them their own designated section in this video, they're not super reliable. Point 3 will show you where to get more boots on the ground info for salaries, but I need to talk more about point 2 first. So obviously I picked accounting since that's what I know, that's what I work in, that's what I'm familiar with. But there's a thing with accounting that kind of throws a spanner in the works here. Accounting is a super broad, versatile career. There are jobs that don't come under accounting, yet they still require accounting skills. Let's go over an example. If you're a regular viewer of mine, first of all, thanks for the continued support. But secondly, you'll know that recently I've discovered that my career path is actually extremely common towards becoming a finance manager, possibly even a financial controller. I never planned this, it just happened. One convoluted evil plan. I didn't have a plan. All that stuff just happened. But I only got onto this path by picking a career that had good job opportunities, thanks to government websites. I know engineering is similar, plenty of options for career paths. So, I was on Seek the other day, Seek is the most common job website here in Australia, and I was just checking out the potential jobs as a finance manager, since I'm like, well, I know accounting has a lot of job openings, but what about the higher up roles? I wonder how many are currently available. Well, to my delight, there's heaps. Obviously, these exact roles won't exist in six plus years down the track. They won't even exist in one and a half months when these roles get filled. But it's reassuring to know that there are an abundance of jobs currently. And given the fact that most white collar uni students are gunning towards tech related roles, it's not as if I'm going to have a giant flood of competition later on. Of course, I will still have some competition, but it's not as if everyone and their brother will have an accounting degree. Anyway, let's go over the screen recording I captured on this particular night. And for good measure, we'll go over another one I recorded about roughly a month later. Did you notice something? Well, first of all, most of these jobs were paying around the $130,000 base mark. And no, these jobs aren't finance specific. You'll find that most of them are accounting specific. In order to become a finance manager, you're better off getting an accounting degree. You can still get them with a finance major, but you're way more likely to get the jobs required to gain the experience required for these finance manager roles with an accounting degree. I'll talk more about a finance degree later in this video. 
The job descriptions for these roles are also super similar to what I'm doing now. They're just a scaled up version of it. Again, I never planned this path. I just picked accounting because it had good job growth. And I happened across this job that I currently have. And it just so turns out it's a great path towards finance manager roles. But it all started by picking something with a lot of job roles available in the future thanks to checking government statistics. But anyway, did you also notice something else other than the salary range? Did you notice how long ago these jobs were posted? Yep, most of these jobs were posted within the last two days of me checking this. Bro, two days! All these roles for $130,000 plus that are basically just scaled up versions of what I'm currently doing, let alone what else was available on page two and beyond, let alone jobs posted within the last 20 days, let alone jobs that were posted months ago that expired and I never saw, let alone all the jobs that will continue to be posted, let alone all the jobs that were posted on other job websites. So this is why you check for current job listings, as it will give you an indication of if the jobs in your desired field are available in your area and what the expected salaries can be. Like you check the salaries from the actual job postings, not the random like salary tracker websites for reasons I mentioned before. They just seem inaccurate and obviously if you're applying for a job that says I will pay you $80,000 and you get there and they pay you 50000 bucks, they can get sued for that shit. So that's why if you want to check salaries, check current job postings, don't check salary tracking websites. Now you can obviously move cities slash states for jobs, but generally people want jobs in a familiar location. For all you know, the neighborhood in your region you want to move to for your new career is noisy, maybe dangerous, but that's a discussion for another video. Case in point, checking current job postings is the second thing you should be doing when checking if a certain career path is a good idea. Thing three, checking forums relating to that career path. Third thing is to get more boots on the ground experience. This can be done through online forums such as Reddit. Now, of course, people can lie on the internet, which is why this is the third thing you do, not the first, but I've found, on the accounting subreddit at least, the answers match up with the real world. For example, public accounting sucks which is what my real-world experience tells me, and it's also what the subreddit says, and industry accounting is great, which is what my real-world experience says, and it's also what the subreddit says. It's also a good way of seeing how other people have progressed in their careers. Maybe you can draw ideas from them. You can also get another reading of salaries in that field. I see financial controllers, which is a step up from finance manager, earning like $220,000 plus in the States. The salaries for those don't get that high here in Australia, at least not from what I've seen, simply because Australia pays blue-collar workers better than white-collar workers, comparatively speaking. But it's still a good gauge of how much income you can make regardless. You can always narrow it down to your location, like the accounting subreddit is mostly the United States specific. There's some European Union in there, some India, and very few Australia. You can also join Facebook groups too, but generally it's easier to find similar people on Reddit. So once you've found a subreddit, relating to the career path that you found that fit the criteria of the first two points, now you start asking questions, or you start lurking. Start reading the posts related to that subreddit to get a general feel of what it's like working in that sector and determine whether it's right for you. And then, I don't know, check YouTube videos too, I guess. Often you can't get a good gauge of what it's like on YouTube since if the content creator you're watching is smart, they'll avoid posting any info slash details that are too specific that could dox them or reveal sensitive company information. Generally, those videos of like a day in the life of a consultant or whatever is lifestyle specific. Like, oh, look at me sleeping in and working from home. Now going to get my espresso spiced pumpkin grande latte coffee. Now I'm going to the office via the tram. Here's the view from our office. Here's some dinner I'm getting with a co-worker. Shit like that. 
in their defense, it's not as if they could say, oh, here I am working on a client's report about their staffing levels and look at how many staff we're going to tell them to cull. But on the exact same note, I hardly see those videos as being focused on the work. I swear, at most, 25% of the video is them talking about their work. The other 75% is super similar to those lazy, useless lifestyle influencers. I suppose lifestyle is more interesting content, but if people wanted to watch some sort of lifestyle stuff, wouldn't they just watch a lifestyle creator instead of someone who actually has a job and is a contributing member of society? If I want to see a day in the life of someone with an actual job, I want to see mostly job-specific stuff. But again, double-edged sword like a do-blade, because providing too much info at work could cause some confidentiality issues or doxing issues. But I'm sure there's got to be a balance somewhere. So anyway, that's why you pick forums over YouTube. You can get the nitty gritty on forums since it's hard to get doxed on forums. And obviously, these people worked hard for their careers, so they're going to be careful. It's a shame cancel culture is a thing. So wrapping up point three, surf online forums relating to the career path you narrowed down after points one and two. Now, quick bonus point, this isn't a critical thing to do but it's relevant whilst we are talking about the career path, the work-life balance, and overtime income. This is why point three is important. The government data on hours worked can sometimes be botched to fit a political narrative, or their method of gathering data is inaccurate. Example, here in Australia, we have the census. It's literally a form you fill out that asks you about your current info relating to employment, like your income and whatnot. You have to answer this or you get into trouble. It's like the same with not voting. Here in Australia, you have to vote. It's part of your paid subscription to the country. You have to do this, but you can lie all you want on this. The idea is to help gauge what communities need help. Maybe I lie and say, I make bugger all money and so does everyone else in my local town. Now, yes, they do have my tax details, so they know how much I actually make. But the Australian Bureau of Statistics is a different entity to the Australian Taxation Office. If they wanted my tax details, they need a warrant. Like how police need a warrant to invade your home. I never knew this was a thing until I got my internship at the tax office. Like, tax office employees can literally get fired on the spot for checking out someone's tax details, they're not meant to. When I was an intern, within my local city and a Melbourne branch, the officer at the tax office told me, and I quote, we've had 160 interns across two branches and we had to march 40 of them out because they were checking things they shouldn't have. So like these interns were checking out how much tennis plays were making, how much their ex was making, how much their neighbour was making, etc., the system they used, called CBEL, had some flag that indicated whenever someone was on a taxpayer's profile that didn't have a warrant. Perhaps it was just in general, like it would show anyone's details that were being looked at, and then the tax office managers were like, hey, wait a minute, we didn't authorise this, and it would show who checked it last. So that's how they probably found out who's on information that they shouldn't have been. So the point of that is to show that the Bureau of Statistics can actually cross-reference my info with the tax info. And even so, it would be super inefficient for them to do so with everyone. So that is to say, government data on hours worked can be inaccurate. Additionally, I doubt it breaks it down sector by sector. And even then, it's an average. Maybe your city slash town doesn't have those work hours. So you can't rely on government data in this sense to tell you how many hours you can expect to work in your desired industry. And you also can't rely on job postings, since if they're one of those shit workplaces that expects a lot of unpaid overtime, no chance they're going to tell you that in the job posting. You'll only find out once you're there on your first day. But even then, in that case, you can see some job postings or say, fast-paced environment or something like that. Usually that's a major red flag that you're going to be under the pump and working some unpaid overtime. Not always, but it's a generalization. So, 
How can you tell how many hours you can be expecting to work? Through the forums. Without working in accounting, you can tell from the forums that you can expect more than a 55-hour week in public accounting. But you can expect 40, maybe less, in industry accounting, which is the type of accounting I'm doing. You don't get this info from government or job websites. Now, as for overtime, I mention this because it can provide some good extra coin if you want. Example, in accounting and many white-collar office sort of roles, you get no overtime. My current workplace doesn't have overtime. It did before my recent promotion. If I worked any extra, I'd get paid some overtime rates for it. This only happened a couple of times, and it only happened as the financial controller and I were going over some stuff. And even then, it's like super specific to my particular role. But I can't provide any more info because doxed. But now, if I do any overtime for whatever reason, such as attending an OH&S meeting, I just take time in lieu. And again, this is specific to my workplace. Some workplaces, if you work overtime, stiff shit, that's your lost time. But as for taking time in lieu, I just take an hour off somewhere else. But in public accounting, you work heaps of unpaid overtime. Stiff shit, just because that's how things roll. Same with Big Law 2. You need to hit a certain number of billable hours, so you generally have to work these extra hours if you want to keep your job. So be wary. Many white-collar roles may require overtime, which is unpaid. If, however, you choose a career like the police force, nursing, being a paramedic, or any sort of trade, you get paid overtime. I work 60-ish hours a week across both of my jobs. If I worked 60 hours a week in one job that paid overtime, I'd be on way more money than I am now. So for example, I'm on about $35.42 per hour base at the office. This doesn't include any retirement fund benefits. Then on Saturday at the supermarket, I make around $31 per hour. And on Sunday, I make around $38 per hour. If these supermarket days were instead overtime at a main full-time job, I'd make around $44 an hour on a Saturday, which is adding a 25% multiplier to my base rate, and then I'd earn $53 an hour on a Sunday, adding a 50% multiplier to my base rate. Maybe more? Depends on what the overtime rates are. So this is another thing to consider. My full-time weekday office job makes it easy to slot a weekend supermarket job around it. This is a bit hard to do, having a second weekend job, if your trade job requires Saturday mornings or if you're a nurse, paramedic or cop that has a rotating 24-7 roster, but you guys have the option of overtime. You don't need a second job, just work more at your current one. Now, yes, this isn't as reliable or consistent as a contract at a second job like I have, but you could work maybe an extra eight hours at overtime rates and make the same I do for a standard extra 16 paid hours at the supermarket. I mean, yes, it would get tedious and tiresome doing the same thing for longer. At the very least, in my case, the supermarket job is a nice shake up from the office, but it's more time efficient to work overtime at a job that allows it rather than working a separate job. So that's yet another point to consider. Now, lastly, I will go over some other additional resources for you to consider before picking a career path. Shane Hummus is a large-ish channel here on YouTube that goes over many different careers. Josh Fluke is kind of the same, except he's more so talking shit about the corporate world. I haven't watched him in a while, since, to be honest, once you've done a ranking slash tier list of useful degrees and reviewed some of them, you don't have much else content to make. There's a finite amount of careers out there, I imagine he's just recycling stuff he's previously made by now. The same way productivity and self-improvement channels recycle the same shit they said three years ago. So he is a good source of info, but you have to consider he's looking at things from a United States point of view. He uses employment and job growth data from there. Now yes, that doesn't mean the info isn't applicable to other countries. Example, engineering, accounting, nursing... Stuff like that are shown as good career paths in his videos, and the same rings true here in Australia. But you really should just get ideas from his videos and then do your extra homework on it. Remember, this is your career. This is most likely the best investment you'll ever make. Don't be lazy on your research in the field. 
So Shane Hummus is one good source of info for picking a career. The next is Aaron Clary. My regular viewers have seen me mention this guy a few times over. I'm yet to do a designated video on channels I think all young guys should watch, and he will be one of them. Now, he doesn't really have a designated video or video series on, here's what you should do, here are the steps. He tends to just spitball random tidbits in amongst his videos, like I do. Or, he only mentions it when responding to a specific video request. However, there is one video I found that wasn't from his channel, but I know it's him because it's his voice. And it's almost like a lecture slash reaction video in a way, that goes over some useful and useless career paths. Once again, gather ideas from there, and do your own further due diligence. Also, check out the upload date from this particular video. 18th of May, 2011, almost 13 years ago, and the advice still holds up to this day. It's timeless advice. I'll play some segments of it soon. Actually, I'm going to play it towards the end of the video, scratch that. So, you get the point. But if you want more ideas for what career paths to go into, check that full video out. But I'll leave you with some ideas. Keep in mind this is not an extensive list of useful careers. This is just what I have seen work from my boots on the ground experience here in Australia. Of course there are other useful career paths. But that's on you to figure out for yourself. Again, I'm teaching you how to fish. I'm not giving you a fish. I'm giving you the treasure map, I'm not giving you the treasure. And I'll also mention some useless degrees, or at least not as useful. I have some friends who actually have degrees I'll mention in the not as useful degree section, and they managed to actually get a job. But even so, they're basically stuck. They don't have options like I do. Example, I've had a number of recruiters offer potential different jobs for me that pay more too since I have a useful degree slash skill, and my workplace knows it, hence why they're being proactive with my promotions and whatnot. I actually mentioned these sort of job postings earlier. I wrote this script on a few separate days, so I'd forgotten I actually mentioned this before. It's common knowledge for those in the career field that job hopping gets you higher salaries, since you're more likely to go from earning $70,000 per year to $80,000 per year by switching jobs, rather than hoping your job gives you a $10,000 raise. But my job is actually bumping my pay up quite a bit. This 70 to 80k raise is actually my base increase for this upcoming financial year. At least, so far it seems that way. Last financial year, I got a 17% raise. This rarely ever happens by staying at one job. Why did this happen? Because my job wants to keep me, and they know I've had recruiters contacting me. And they don't want to lose me since I'm harder to replace. Now, yes, there's an element of just being good at your job and them wanting to keep things streamlined and easy for themselves. Example, it's better to pay your current employee 10 to 20k more if your operations are running smoothly rather than paying a new one at a higher salary and maybe they're shit at the role. And there's also the additional administrative burden, job advert costs, time spent on interviews, etc. But if you're an employer and you know you can replace your employee really easily and find others who just do the work for cheaper, why spend the extra 20k a year to keep them? You wouldn't. Now, I will admit most workplaces don't think in the sense that pay your current employees more so they don't leave, but if my workplace wasn't like that, I could have jumped ship for a higher salary by now. I'll talk about it in a future video, but I've lost more than 22,000 bucks in the last couple of years by not job hopping. In fact, it's probably more like $34,000 plus, but I have my own reasons why I didn't leave that aren't important for the sake of this video. So anyway, the point of that is to showcase that I have options because I have a versatile, useful degree, or versatile, useful skill set. It doesn't always have to be a degree, like trades are obviously really good too. Most people hate their jobs, mainly because of their managers slash bosses. Yes, maybe the work sucks, but if you're with good people, you don't hate it as much. So if you have a valuable skill slash trade slash education, if you're fed up with their bullshit, you can just leave for a better place. Anyway, some useful degrees to consider, not blindly jump into, are basically anything engineering. Nursing, medicine, paramedicine, doctor slash anything hospital related. 
accounting, data science, data science, data analyst slash analytics, teaching, at least here in Australia. Here in Australia, teachers have consistent pay increases and you can make six figures within eight to 10 years as a teacher here. Apparently, it's not such a good deal in the United States. Again, do your own homework. Basically, any trade, at least here in Australia, check your country's job prospects and whatnot. Electrician and plumbing are like the most common ones here in Australia, but carpenters, builders, HVAC, painting, etc. all have their place. Most things IT, including software engineer, although I guess that comes under engineer, cybersecurity, computer science, etc. Now, a grey area is finance and law, at least from what I've seen here in Australia. I know two finance slash financial planning people from my uni who got shit jobs they hated and they didn't pay that well since there's no real investment banking culture here in Australia. We have like Macquarie Bank, but that's about it. Most finance majors get into smaller financial planning firms. One of them isn't working in the field anymore. She's actually a stay-at-home mum now. And the other works for the Australian Bureau of Statistics. It was that friend I mentioned in the first section. And he's doing something that you don't need his degree for. My cousin knows a mate who did finance at uni and dropped out of his job after six months to pursue a trade since he hated the environment so much. So why didn't he just leave for a new job instead? Because there isn't that many finance major specific jobs here in Australia. There is a difference between accounting and finance. They are similar in some senses, but they're not a one-to-one overlap. So this finance guy that dropped out couldn't just move to a different firm since there weren't any other firms to move to. Now again, this is my boots on the ground experience in Australia. I know finance can be pretty sick in the States and the United Kingdom. One guy I knew from high school slash uni moved to the UK to work in finance and now he's in the States working in finance at like the big hedge funds or something. He's actually one of the guys I mentioned in the sort of comparing yourself to others sort of video I made a while ago. So why did he move? More maybe because he wanted to move, but it's also because there just is not that much of a finance investment banking scene here in Australia. Like besides that guy, I have heard of zero people from my uni who went on to work in hedge funds or whatever. It could be due to the fact that it's super competitive and here in Australia, you simply cannot compete with the Asian and Indian international students. They're just too ahead of the curve. They're just too smart and too hardworking. You just can't compete. So then the other finance majors who didn't get the perfect grades and good connections, etc., worked in those crappier jobs I mentioned before. So in this case, why not get a more versatile degree? But as I said, it's also because the investment banking scene here in Oz simply isn't that good. I am 100% certain that if it was, I would have known someone or heard of someone who worked in that field by now. One of my old managers at the supermarket job was dating slash engaged to this guy who worked in finance and she told me that he was just doing the basic standard finance stuff, which here in Australia tends to refer to just general tax planning and retirement fund advice. Super generic stuff that most finance people here in Australia do. Like I had a mate who worked for one of the big four banks here And he said that's basically what he did for a while. And my other mate who got a finance and financial planning degree basically said he did the same thing. It's not just at the big four bank. And the manager was saying how her partner, who worked in finance, wanted to start managing people's money, like a hedge fund manager would. So why wasn't he already working in that field? If he wanted to do it, why didn't he? Because again... The investment banking slash hedge fund scene in Australia simply just isn't there. Now, I'll talk about another example. Hear me out. It's relevant. Mining is one of the highest paying industries here in Australia. You see it on social media groups. You hear it along the grapevine. Mining workers, fly-in, fly-out workers here in Australia, make the best coin. Now, you can get some jobs in this field without a trade, but most FIFO workers have a trade. Yes, there's a lot of engineers too, some accounts as well to obviously take care of the finance side of things, but FIFO workers make upwards of $150,000 a year in quite a lot of cases. Insane coin. 
Now, in most cases, you need to know someone who knows someone who works in the mines in order to get a job there. And despite the fact that I went to university, polar opposite of the trades, I still know people who worked in the mines slash got into the mines. My cousin got a job in the mines for a while through a friend of his. This guy I used to work with at the supermarket recently left to go work in the mines. He did like explosives or something. You don't need a trade for that. Like he won't be on 150000 bucks a year for a little bit, but he starts off on like 96000 or something. Pretty good. He got that job through his friend. My other cousins in Western Australia basically work in the mines, which is a path I was considering back in 2022. I talked about it in this video. So, I went to university, not trade school, and I work in accounting slash corporate Australia, not the trades, and yet, I know people who worked in the highest paying trade roles, aka mining, but yet, I know no one who's worked in the top field in finance. How is this even possible? Because Australia's investment banking scene simply is just nowhere near as good as it is in the States or the United Kingdom. It doesn't matter how much you could earn from a job in investment banking here in Australia, if you can't even get the job in the first place, it doesn't matter. Fortunately for most of my viewers, a good chunk of you guys are either from the States or the UK, so all things considered, finance is a good degree over there. Aaron Clary disagrees. He suggests accounting if you're going to do a commerce slash business related degree, but if it gets you a job in investment banking, it can't be useless in my eyes. But again, do your own homework for your server, your country, to see what the job prospects are like. As for law, I heard some statistic thrown around that there was one law job for every 10 graduates. Whether this is true or not, I don't know. And although there is a lot of demand for lawyers around, the supply is also huge, at least in my region. Whether it's because people find law interesting, or they know there is some big coin to make in law at higher levels, I don't know. Or maybe they're part of the whole doctor or lawyer indoctrination type of thing that a lot of us were fed when we were kids. But regardless, there is a huge amount of supply of law students. I remember chatting up this law student I met on Tinder in my uni days, and she was saying how she had to volunteer one day a week at some law firm or in the legal department at some council just for experience. Otherwise, she wouldn't be considered for law roles. This is while she's at uni studying a law degree, a very difficult degree, and working an actual part-time job that pays her money. Now, she didn't gym, so if she did have that, there's even more time for her to schedule. But she wasn't fat, hence why I, a gym rat, was hitting up a non-gym chick. As much as I love me a gym girl, I also love me a smart girl. She also didn't skip chest day despite not going to the gym if you get my drift. Another reason to chat her up. But anyway, she's legit volunteering her time just for the sake of being considered. In accounting, you don't need to do that. Stuff like having an internship helps your resume a lot, but it's not crucial to have. And even so, at my uni at least, an internship counted towards a completed unit in your degree. So despite not being paid, you were, I guess, being paid in the sense that you didn't have to do assignments slash study slash take quizzes, etc. You got to actually do something. Not in the case with law. There's also the fact that law degrees are more expensive, I can talk about the implications of a large student debt versus earning potential another time, but it's something to consider. I also had another friend. He was the school captain of our high school in our year level. So, you know, smart guy. And he did a law degree. And he was saying how hard it was to find work. I am fairly sure he said he volunteered at two different places at different times. You know, not an internship not something that counts towards your degree. He eventually got a job, but damn did it take a while and more effort than it was probably worth. For reference, every teacher slash nursing student I knew had a job almost directly after graduation. Those in commerce took maybe up to six months. I took longer, but if you've seen my life story before, you know that I was an idiot and I severely handicapped myself in my degree slash path. But I am an outlier. Even the people I wasn't friends with and just knew of all had some sort of jobs shortly after graduating. 
now might be a good time to talk about the less useful degrees. But to finish off the law segment, it will depend on your region, but consider all that extra work involved, such as volunteering your time, like the law chick with the big tits and my high school captain had to do. Maybe it's different where you're from. I know one of my boys, physique every week, is a law student, or maybe he's a lawyer now. So, hey man, if you're watching this, can you let me know what your experience is like with getting jobs and whatnot in the comments? Thanks, man. So, as for less useful degrees, most business majors, such as HR, marketing, business. Now, I know friends in HR slash marketing who have jobs, but as I said before, they don't have much leverage. My HR friend was messaging me ages ago asking about accounting, since he was like, I do like my current job, but I don't think I want my boss's job, which is the only progress up I can make. Again, he's stuck. Unless he wanted to earn basically the same money forever, or unless he wants to do a job he doesn't like. He'd need some other skills slash more leverage over his workplace. Yes, maybe he'd get raises of 2 to 3% per year, but this isn't a 17% jump like I got last financial year. He got a new job now in like a not-for-profit organization, earning pretty good money, which is yet another thing I'll talk about in the future. I'll mention why I don't donate any money. And part of the reason is, you do realize most of your donation money is going towards paying the salaries of these not-for-profit workers, right? In most cases, they're earning way more than they would in for-profit companies, but that's going to be elaborated on in a future video like the distant future. I'd be surprised if I made that video before 2026, to be honest. Anyway, HR is also super woke. So if you're not a fan of that shit, don't do it. And plus with AI evolving, you know, AI can scan for resumes and shit, HR is becoming less and less needed. Yes, they will still probably need some humans to do HR, but not as many. I do see some job growth still as companies expand and whatnot, but if you're a big company and you want to grow more, you'd probably hire five software engineers as opposed to five HR staff, you know? However, since the governments are becoming even more woke, there'll probably be some corporate bureaucracy requiring even more diversity quotas to be ticked, meaning HR will have a role going forward. Maybe I'm biased since I hate woke shit and I struggle to understand what talents HR has, so maybe this is a good path, but if you're a straight white man, good luck getting a job in HR, you don't tick enough diversity hire quotas. But again, do your own homework in your region. Marketing. Again, I have friends who majored in marketing who have jobs, but a more efficient alternative in many cases is just to pay an influencer to promote your stuff. It does have its place, but there are better degrees out there. And even then, um, like if you have a marketing degree, there's not as many job options for like accounting, for example. Like there can be a small business with like seven staff and one of them will have to be an accountant just because of all the government regulations with money and whatnot. But they probably won't need a marketing person since they're only like a seven to eight people company. So like there are like big corporations that will have marketing departments and whatnot. But you'd have troubles getting jobs at smaller places. Just something to consider. Anything that falls under arts besides teaching. Art majors are the butt of jokes amongst many people with useful qualifications. But generally, these are useless. If you find them interesting, study it slash research it in your spare time. I'm a fan of World War II, for example, but I didn't go and get a history degree. Well, like, I'm not a fan of World War II. Like, I find it interesting, right? Like, you know... Don't go into debt slash spend years of your life studying something that isn't going to increase your earnings potential per hour. Language degrees. Most translators don't make much. I know a girl who is studying German as like a double degree alongside politics or something. I don't know enough about politics degrees. I'd imagine they'd fall under the grey area. But this could be useful since Germany has a good economy. Or at least it's better than a lot of other countries. So maybe she could eventually work as like a foreign minister or in the international relations part of parliament or some shit. I don't know, but at least she's not exclusively majoring in a language. Plus, the job prospects for this are minuscule compared to other regions. 
I can go for a drive around my local city and find a couple of hospitals, many schools, many businesses slash accounting firms, even law firms, engineering businesses, etc. But how many translators are us buildings do I find? None. Yes, there's a need, but it's such a small amount. You're better off studying something that has abundant job growth. Journalism? These days, journalists just write articles about nonsense they don't understand. It's super common when complaining about the economy. Here in Australia, there's many articles that blame greedy corporations, such as the large two supermarkets here in Australia, for their record profits. Well, for starters, all corporations are greedy, you genius. Second, their profits slash revenue hasn't drastically increased since like 2015, so there's no record profits here. Third, you want companies to make profits. That means they are growing and they can provide more jobs. But since you're a journalist, I don't expect you to know how basic economics works. Fourth, the margins for supermarket chains are super small, as is the case with most food-related businesses. Since I work part-time at a supermarket and I work in a department that has many perishable products, I can see firsthand how many food items that often need to be reduced and what needs to be dumped, as well as how many products that just get damaged slash broken before they even have the chance to be sold. So-called news articles these days are nothing more than emotional rants. No need to spend years of your life studying for this shit. Anyone can write up an incoherent ramble on the internet. I'm subscribed to a lot of finance slash stock market related newsletters None of these writers have a journalism degree, but yet they can write pretty well and provide useful information. Yet more proof journalism is a useless degree. I don't know how this would work if you wanted to be like a journalist for like the NBA or like some sports or some shit, but even then a lot of them ask the dumbest questions. Like the time in the 2018 finals where LeBron got asked if they were looking at defending their home court when they were down 3-0. It's like, no shit, nah, he's looking at getting swept, you idiot. And I know Greg Popovich roasted a lot of reporters before. Like, they ask him a dumb question, and he's like, well, do you want me to make a trade at halftime or something? So, anyway, case in point, journalism, probably, well, not probably, definitely not your best bet for a degree. Psychology? A base psychology degree doesn't get you anything. But you do need this if you want to go on to a master's which is what you need when you want to become a psychologist or psychiatrist. I have my own opinions on these fields. For the most part, I think they're unhelpful. I know some people benefit from a psychologist, and I'm happy for you. But in many cases, they don't work. If you've been going to one for years and years and still aren't feeling any better, what help have they been? All that education, including a master's, and you still can't properly help someone? Imagine getting a master's in engineering and failing to design a bridge correctly or something like that. You wouldn't have a job for much longer. Yet, people still keep going to see a psychologist when it hasn't helped. But that's a topic for another video. For the sake of this one, a base psychology degree is useless. I know a heap of the classic Starbucks latte chicks who went into psych, but they didn't have the grades to get into the master's, and now they're stuck with a useless degree. I too was tempted to do psychology. I thought it was interesting. But the grades required to get into a master's lock out a lot of people. In accounting, you can get into the CPA program regardless of your bachelor's degree grades. My average was like 56% for my bachelor's. Pretty horseshit. That's barely a pass per subject. And this was because I failed so many units that it obviously just dragged my average way down. Like, at one point in my degree, I was averaging, like, 47% or something, like, because I was barely passing units, and then when I did fail, it obviously dragged my average grade under 50%. But yet, I still got into the CPA program, because the CPA program doesn't have a grade requirement. My friend got a psych degree, and he said you needed an average of 75% to get into the master's. So, if we flip this and used my 56% average, and I tried to get into a master's in psych, I'd be denied. I'd have a useless degree on my hands. Now, I didn't say a master's in psych was useless. I just said the bachelor's degree in psych is useless. Don't twist my words and pretend I said a master's in psych gets you no jobs. I can give my total thoughts another time, 
but the base degree doesn't get you a job. Exercise slash health science. Same with psychology. The base degree is useless. It can unlock the path to get into a master's, which is how you become a chiropractor, physiotherapist, and stuff like that. But the base degree is useless. It can help you get a job as a personal trainer, but you can just get a Cert 4 in fitness. Way quicker, way cheaper in fact. I have a Cert 4 in fitness too. I did this alongside my degree in accounting. And yet, it was just as useful as a bachelor's degree in sports science. One may argue, the degree isn't useless if it allows you to get into a master's. Yes, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the base degree being useless for job prospects. An accounting bachelor's is required to get into the CPA program, which is where the big bucks are. But a bachelor's in accounting can still get you many jobs. Just not the super high paying ones like finance manager, which is what I've been talking about on my channel for a while now. Most accounting majors I knew from my university didn't pursue their CPA, or at least they haven't at this stage in their career, and they all still have decent jobs. If you had a base psych degree or a base sports science degree, you would not be in the same boat as those with a base accounting degree, which is someone who actually has a job. Next, gender studies, also a useless degree. If I'm running a business, I don't need anyone making up some nonsense on how misogynistic my business operations are. Although I will say, with the way governments are becoming more woke, I bet you gender studies will become some sort of requirement for some government jobs, or at least it'll be looked upon favorably. Many media-related degrees. I know someone who used to work at the supermarket who was doing this at uni, and her goal was to, like, do the media stuff for Marvel, like all the special effects and whatnot. If this is your ambition, then maybe this can work. But for the most part, if you just want to create content, like most online content creators, you don't need to go into debt and spend years of your life for this. There's plenty of free resources online that can teach you how to create media-related content. Also, any degrees that student-athletes tend to do. In some cases, student-athletes need to get a degree, so what do you think they're going to do? Are they going to do some STEM degree that would basically cut into their practice time and ruin their chances at being drafted? Or do you think they're going to pick the easiest, simplest degree so now they can spend more time practicing their sport? Exactly. They're going to enroll in the easy degrees. Now, maybe in some cases, you will have a student athlete pick a useful degree if they're like unsure they'll get drafted. But if you're projected to go in the top 10 in the draft, why on earth would you bother spending heaps of time on a STEM degree? Just focus on the sport. If you suffer some career-ending injury, then go back and get a useful education. But don't jeopardize your very likely chances at the draft to pursue some standard career path like schmucks like myself. Liberal arts, this gets memed a lot, but I will say I've seen some cases in the US of some companies requiring a degree, even if it's liberal arts, but generally, these jobs aren't super high paying, so you're going into a huge amount of debt to get a job that isn't much higher than the standard minimum wage. Example, you make like, I don't know, $13 an hour at Walmart or something, but you get your liberal arts degree and it lets you get a job at some place that pays like $16 an hour? Shit trade-off. Don't do it. You're better off spending those years of studying just working more, not to mention the huge amount of debt you'll have afterwards. Also, I've been talking a lot about student debt this whole time. I know some European countries don't have debt. University is free. So if you're from there, obviously just disregard the trade-off of going into debt for a useful degree. I've heard of some loophole of going to get your degree in Europe, like Germany or Denmark, so you don't rack up student debt in countries such as the United States or Australia. I don't know much about this. It could be cheaper to live abroad for a few years and get your degree overseas rather than rack up the debt and pay for it later, but I'm also unsure if you'd have to work in that country you got the degree in, or even if the home country recognises your degree. I know Australia doesn't recognise some degrees achieved overseas, like I've heard of some Indian cab drivers needing to drive like taxi or Uber for a while, since Australia didn't recognise their medical degree. Keep in mind, do your own homework on this. I don't know much about it, and I've already racked up debt, 
and gotten my degree here in Australia, so this stuff doesn't concern me personally. And lastly, some master's degrees. Usually it's more R-related masters that are useless, but in many cases a master's degree doesn't give you much of an added benefit, such as accounting. A master's in accounting, for the most part, doesn't do much, here in Australia anyway. I recall hearing that there is some use for it in the States. Maybe it's only to get CPA continuing credit hours or some shit? I don't know. But me getting my master's adds bugger all credit to my resume or my labour market skills. That's what a CPA does. So again, check if master's degrees in your field are actually useful. Don't go another couple of years studying something difficult and adding more onto your student debt for a minuscule, if any, improvement to your career stat. Just use that time for chilling out. Working on a side hustle, working another job, I don't know. But generally, the minor bump to the career stat is not worth the effort. So now, I'll play some segments from that Aaron Clary video, and you'll see he shares a lot of my insights. I just wanted to say, I graduate in 2011. The atmosphere in all of the college students I know is absolute gloom. Um, there are, the bachelor's degree doesn't really mean as much as it used to. Everyone kind of feels that it's been watered down. Grad school is the only option. My sister just graduated and couldn't find a job, so she went to South Korea to teach. And even people graduating law school, I know, um, are working at restaurants as hostesses and servers. And what's your major, Sarah? Political Science International Affairs. And uh, have, have you been thinking about something? Well, how does the market look uh, there in Tallahassee? Uh, well, there's small government jobs. I could do, uh, like, municipal work, stuff like that. But really, 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 the, the only option is grad school and maybe eventually get my Ph.D. There's just your bachelor's degree is, is the equivalent of a high school degree for, uh, now. Uh, Ed Koch, is, uh, is Sarah thinking correctly? I'm sorry? Not quite. No, not, not quite. The um, the bachelor's degree. I mean, it's it's first first of all for political science major. It's one of the weaker fields this year. Uh, let's get another call around. I just recently graduated in May with a bachelor's of science in community and regional planning and a certificate in geographic information systems uh, from Appalachian State University. And are you having any luck with uh, with the job uh, with the job? Well, I have been looking really in since February, and it's been difficult. I actually am looking all over the country trying to get any job in pretty much any field that will take me from urban planning to I also have broadcasting experience and I even have a headhunter in the United Kingdom trying to place me in positions there. I see. Uh, well, stay out of radio. Uh, but, <laughs> excuse me, James, we just don't like competition. Um, uh, Ed Koch, is, uh, is, uh, is James's experience uh, cog uh, you know, consonant with what you're hearing? Yeah, I, I, James' experience is cer certainly isn't unusual, especially in the uh, areas that he's uh, uh, majored in. Um, er, right now, uh, urban planning or something like that would be uh, a, a local government area, and uh, state budgets and local budgets have been really restricted, so government jobs uh, at the state and local level are not plentiful this year. Uh, in addition, if he's looking at broadcasting, journalism, um, that hasn't been a robust field for several years now. So let's see if we go next to Andrea. Andrea calling us from St. Paul. Yes, um, thanks for having me. Sure. Um, well, I graduated from the University of Minnesota with a natural resources degree, um, and I was curious to know where are all these green jobs? Because I cannot find, I'm doing internships, I've been doing internships for the last two years, but I really haven't seen any increase in green jobs that everybody's talking about. Uh, green jobs like, um, well, there's park ranger, but uh, what else are you talking about there? Yeah, like uh, conservation managers. Um, I, I I don't know. They just say green jobs, and I've been looking for a job for two years now, and uh, it's really really frustrating. I mean, I'm doing internships, which is great, mm -hmm. um, and really increases my 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 um, experience, which everybody asks for. But you know, you can't you can't get a job, you can't get experience. But uh, yeah, I mean, do you have any advice for somebody who is uh, seeking out? Uh, a, a green job position, or where should I look? Ed Koch, any ideas? Well, one of the problems with the green job area is that there, there was a lot of speculation that there'd be a lot of investment uh, with the uh, 
rise in oil prices uh, a couple of years ago in uh, green technologies and uh, new industries being created that would be focused on conservation and green jobs. Uh, consequently, a lot of students actually uh, responded to that by going into environmental science and conservation programs in, in the anticipation that these were, would be the new fields. And they still may be, but they haven't materialized just yet. Um, so I don't have much advice for it because the, those jobs just haven't materialized right now. Uh, they're still waiting for some levels of investment, either from government or from the private sector, and more than likely they're going to have to wait for the uh, oil prices to skyrocket again. From whatever degree it was that she got, and uh, she can't find a job uh, either. Now, the question that they're always asking here is why can't I find a job, and the reason why is that you have a worthless degree to do where I want, I want to be an artist, or I want to be a philosophy major, man, and philosophy size, and all, all right, you see the mismatch, you see the gap. Now, here are the realities of the labor market. This is what you can expect to make with a bachelor's degree, and this simply is nothing more than a mathematical representation of demand. It shows you what is in demand. If you look at the top here, you'll see all the engineering fields, computer science, electrical, chemical, mechanical engineering, all those things make the stuff you want to buy. It's no surprise, it's no shock that the uh, degrees that are highest paying are the ones that go and make the iPods and the Xboxes and the, and the this and the that. You go down below and you see, okay, what are the worst paying degrees? Psychology, secondary school teacher, bio life sciences, environmental science, marketing, right? Why? Because no one wants psychology, environmental science. Marketing. You don't. No one. No one demands that. That's why. That's, that's not because these are bad people or people are somehow being punished or there's a conspiracy. If you go back to the bartering example, it shows you. Okay. Hey, what is in demand versus what people want to major in? Another side of this is the sheer supply. I mean, there's demand, but then there's also supply. How many en chemical engineers are there for every secondary school teacher? How many electrical engineering majors are there for every psychology major? And you'll find, wait till you kids, and I'm talking primarily to the guys now, you'll go to, you'll go to high school, you'll be a junior or senior in high school, and you're going to talk to your female friends, and honest to God, this is the way it was when I, I mean, half of them, all were going to go major in child psychology. All chill. You need to be like everybody else and produce something of value. Reason two, worthless guidance counselor. I cannot think of a profession that has failed youth more than guidance counselors. These people are, are absolutely horrible at conveying the economic realities of the labor market to the youth. They, what, again, like the parents, they're spineless. They don't want to tell you the reality. Well, whatever you want, you follow your dream. You follow your heart's desire. No, first you put food on the table by finding a job that's going to pay, which means you have to get a degree or a skill that's going to get you that job. Then once you have food, clothing, and shelter taken care of, then you pursue your dream. That's a hobby. Maybe you go and you start a business that is your dreams, but you don't say, well, I'm going to major in writing. I got this second cousin or some kind of, I don't know, in, indirectly not blood related. Guy's got to be like 40, 45. He's going back to get his master's in creative writing. What the hell? What do, what do you mean a master? Just write. What do you, I wrote a book for crying out loud. I, and I flunked out of seventh grade English by the way. It worthless stuff. Okay, the World War II generation, you didn't have. Uh, um, uh, hyphenated American studies. You didn't have sociology. You had engineering, nursing, accounting. I mean, there was there was some law. You know, the, you had the classical liberal arts, but you 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 had the the, the 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 degrees were tied to a job in the end. Uh, people into a law degree, into a philosophy degree, because it doesn't cost as much overhead. A perfect example: the U of M, the, the College of Liberal Arts over here in Minnesota. Uh, they require that you have three years of a foreign language if you graduate with a liberal arts degree. Why? If you look, you'd think, okay, translators must make a lot of money. They don't. There, there's not a lot of – translators don't make that much money unless you don't like working at the high end. Uh, but why do they require that? Because so many bleeping uh, Spanish majors and German majors and, and Italian majors got the degrees in this language, couldn't find jobs, and where do they go? Well, let's go get our masters in Italian and Spanish. And what can I do? I can teach future Italian majors and Spanish majors and German majors and Norwegian majors. Right? It's not for anything as noble as helping you kids get – they'll say, well, it's to make you well-rounded. No, 
You don't want to be well-rounded. You want to have a specific skill and a trade to get you a job. But that's that's the line they're going to throw you. When in reality, it's just an employment vehicle for washed-up uh, language majors uh, for society. But let's revisit uh, y yourself here because this is very important. It is in your best interest to major in the right thing. Right? You're going to make more money. You're going to have a higher income, and life is going to be easier. You're going to avoid positive, uh, poverty, but life is going to be much easier if you major in the right thing. At first, because you're you're one of these dumb youth running out of bushes, jumping into trees, climbing rocks like you do, right? you, you look at it and say, well, I don't want to go in engineering. That's too hard. It is infinitely more difficult to major in a worthless degree and then try and find employment for the next 20 years than it is taking your hard knocks first. Getting your degree in computer engineering or computer networking or uh, engineering or accounting, I know you're not going to like it, but college is not meant to be fun. It's not. I know every. I know TV, and everyone says it's supposed to be fun. It's supposed to be work. And if you put your, your, your dues in now, when you graduate, you're going to have so much more of an easier life. I am a, a buddy of yourself. Right? So a couple lessons here to take away. Don't shoot the messenger. I am on your side. I know what I say is probably in conflict with some of your teachers say and what sometimes the parents say. Uh, but you know, consider it getting a second opinion from a doctor or a different doctor's second opinion. Right? Again, it doesn't matter what you want. It's what society wants because you are going to get paid by society. So go and get a skill that is going to help you provide what society wants, and you'll, you'll do much better. Okay? So, that's three things, plus a bonus tip, that you need to consider when choosing your career. Spend a lot of time with this decision, as it's one of the most important financial decisions you will ever make. Hope this provided some guidance. Thanks for watching. That is all.